welcome to Canonical. I'm James Shaw, and I'm joined by Iad Darris and Sam Spieler. Hey, good evening. Today we are concluding our discussion of The Sympathizer by Viet Dan Nguyen, the second book in our series, Rich Country, Poor Country. If you're joining us for the first time, you can find us on social media and on Reddit at Canonical Pod. Next week, we will continue our series with a review of Paradise by Abdur Razak Gurna. We hope you'll join us for that one as well. In this episode, what I really want to discuss is the end of the novel and how it might help us understand the political significance of the whole novel. This is a novel of ideas, as we've said several times when we're discussing it, and because it's a novel of ideas, I think that the idea that the narrator eventually settles on matters a lot. So at the end of the novel, our unnamed narrator is on a boat. He's leaving Vietnam with many other refugees, and he muses that if they ever reach safety, they will probably still turn their backs on the less fortunate. He says that's just human nature. Even though that's true, he says that they're not cynical because they are still revolutionaries, even if right now their only cause is wanting to live. This, I think, is a very interesting position to take. Then at the end of my copy of the novel, there was a short interview with Paul Tran from the Asian American Writers Workshop. In that interview, Nguyen talks about the influence of Ralph Ellison's The Invisible Man on the ending of the novel. Nguyen says, I was thinking really explicitly about Ralph Ellison's The Invisible Man, which influenced me a lot. Ellison's book traces a similar narrative of someone coming into consciousness, becoming a revolutionary, and then discovering that the revolution has failed turns back to individualism. The ending of the novel is my disagreement with Ellison, because even though the revolution fails our protagonist, he doesn't feel the need to go in the opposite direction and claim that now all that's left for him is to be the individual. I think there is quite a lot going on in that quote, but let's start with one specific point. In the same passage in the novel, the narrator says, Soon enough, we will see the scarlet sunrise on that horizon where the east is always red. This, to me, I think is a very obvious signal. Does that mean that he still thinks that communism is the right choice for them? And when he says them or we, who is he speaking for? I think this is a little tough for me to answer because... Like you said, there are a lot of things going on. Uh, at this point, his mind is kind of broken. So there are two we's that are being employed here. There's the narrator's two minds. And then there's also the royal or metaphorical we that includes all of Vietnam or at least its refugees. But I, I think Vietnam at large and possibly Asia at large as well. Uh, but I don't know if we can go that far. However, since that first we includes both of his minds, I think it seems to me like he has wholly chosen communism and that that's what he means by we. I think it's also easy to read that this choice is both for himself and for Vietnam because he's using that we. So when he says that they will see or they hope to see a scarlet sunrise on the horizon where the east is always red. Is he just speaking for himself, for Vietnam, for Asia? Who is he speaking for? Well, I think it's a little bit unclear. What makes it unclear for me is by the end of the book, I'm not sure that he is speaking for anyone besides himself because of what he just encountered. And that whole section, it seems to me that he is speaking mainly about his personal journey. So did you read it otherwise? Did you read it as if he's speaking for his country? I think the smallest group is probably him and the other refugees in the boat at that moment. Because earlier in the same passage, he's talking about their experience, their shared experience 
on the boat. And that, to me, I'm pretty confident in. But spreading it even larger than that, I think, is still a possibility. Because I think that this is a socially motivated novel. And I think that the narrator has an opinion. And when he says we, it's very difficult for me not to spread that opinion as far as possible. Beyond Vietnam, I don't know if he's saying much about Asia, but just this line that he uses, this is one of those lines that I think comes from one of those Chinese red songs, you know, where they're talking about the inevitability of communism in Asia. Besides that, if we do see him wholly embracing communism, what does that mean in light of this comparison to Ellison that he mentioned earlier, where he says in Ellison's novel, the revolution fails him, so he turns back to being just the individual. Whereas in this novel, the revolution may have failed him, but he is not just being an individual. Do you get the sense by the end of the book that he thinks the iteration of communism that has been created is what he wants, is the communism or revolution that he's talking about here? Because for me, it seems like he's disappointed and he's saying there's the next revolution. That's the issue that I have as well, is that he has a sincere, unironic embrace of communism. But it also lacks nuance. We don't know if what he is embracing is the same thing that he has already experienced or if he is hoping or demanding for something new. I find it difficult to believe that he is satisfied with this iteration of communism. But what we don't see on the page is him working through these ideas. Because we don't see it, I could only assume that it's not happening. Yeah, so when I reached that point in the book, for me, it was less of an exaltation of communism, but more of a call for continuous change. And so in Ellison, he's rejecting revolution and turning toward individualism, which seems like a rejection of socialist politics, right? I don't know if we can draw the same connection here, because I don't think he's rejecting communism or socialism. I think what he's embracing is continued change. So it seems less of a political statement in that regard. It's more of a, a more broader statement in regards to change because the current iteration of Vietnam in that book was not satisfactory to him. I can see that, but when I see that, I'm wondering if that's what I bring to the table as a reader or if that's what's really in the text. Because the line about the scarlet sunrise on the horizon where the east is always red is a very historicized line. It belongs to a very specific time and a very specific type of communism. I agree that it doesn't mean that we need to reject communism wholesale, but if there is going to be something more, a continuous change or a re-examination of ideas, that kind of historical grounding that we get from that line seems to be too much. It's a very idealistic phrase, right? I don't know if I should read it seriously, because the phrase is a call for revolution. Like when people say the East is always red, they're not saying descriptively. They're saying it as a call to action, like someday we will prevail. Isn't that how you understand it as well? He also goes on, though, at the end, he says, we lie in wait for the right moment and the just cause, which at this moment is simply wanting to live. So in some way, maybe part of this revolution, part of this revolutionary action is survival or thriving. I mean, that's kind of simplistic to look at it that way, but given the rest of the book and how, how we've talked about the issue of being overlooked, James, I think you, in comparing this with Ellison, were talking about the Vietnamese refugee being an overlooked population. So in some way, then, this surviving and thriving on penalty of death 
is an act of revolution. I mean, that doesn't speak to the communism per se, but he's talking about revolution. He's not specifically talking about communism at the end. So to your question from before, Yad, the sentence directly before that, I think, makes it quite clear that it's not just us bringing our interpretation to the book, because he says right before, we ourselves revolutionary. We remain that most hopeful of creatures, a revolutionary in search of a revolution. Like, it seems quite clear that he's still looking for the next stage, the revolution that will actually um, satisfy what he thinks society should be like or whatever. In an interview with The Guardian, Nguyen mentions the ending of the novel again. He says, had The Sympathizer been written for a white audience, the ending would be radically different. His narrator never rejects communism, for example. He said, I wrote as if I had all the privilege of a majority writer, and majority writers never have to translate or pander. So my question here is, if Nguyen is asserting that white readers might expect or demand the protagonist to reject communism, is the corollary to that that non-white readers would be more likely to accept communism. Is that kind of assertion valid to you? Uh, I think it's a bold assertion, but I think the claim I'd be more comfortable with is that a non-white audience may be more willing to listen to a pro-communist take. I think with white American politics specifically being what they are, there's just such a knee-jerk reaction to communism or socialism, that just broaching that subject in any form is a no-go. And maybe that's not true for many non-white readers. But I think there are caveats to that as well. Cuban Americans, for example, especially of a certain age, would likely disagree. How true do you think this is, that white audiences would reject communism? That's the part that I get hung up on. because. It's a bold claim to say that. I, I feel very America-centric to say this because he's not saying white readers. What he's saying is American readers, right? Um, I'm not moving away from this, but I do have another question. Yeah, in our review episode, I believe you said that you have to share a certain sort of politics with Nguyen or with the narrator, maybe in order to get behind this. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at here. And I'm not sure if I agree with that either. Is that what I said? I don't know if that's true. I think that it helps, obviously, with anything if you share a sentiment with the person who created the work. But I think that if it's an intellectual discussion and the ideas are treated fairly and explored in depth, even if you don't agree with the conclusion, I think the process can still be enjoyable. I think if it's a question of me not appreciating the value of communism because I'm white, or of me not agreeing with communism and thereby not agreeing with this novel, then I would side with James that I don't think that that's really true. I would say that there are quite a few white readers in the world who would not reject the novel because the main character does not disavow communism. Well, the reason why I am harping on this word white is if we replace it with American, then obviously America is the largest proponent of the current iteration of liberalism, right? Like we export liberal democracy. and. I think it is very hard for an American reader who is white to understand that other point of view. And I think similarly, someone who is not a white American would be more open to it because they are more open to other lifestyles and other cultures. So for me, that makes complete sense. That's why I get hung up on this limiting descriptor of whiteness, because that's very broad. I don't know if I would be comfortable with that claim, like all white people feel a certain way about communism and all Asians feel 
a certain other way about communism. That seems very strange. Yeah, that's why I said American in my response, because I took it to mean that's what he was speaking to, even though he doesn't say that. Yeah, I know you did, which is why I, I'm kind of caught up in it, you know, in your response, because I agree with it, mm. but it's not what he said. So right. that's where I get confused. I think that's what he meant, personally. I think that perhaps I'm having the expected response, the negative response. And if he is saying that if he had written this character in order to pander to a white audience by making this character reject communism, I would say that that wouldn't necessarily solve the problem that I have with the end of the novel. It would make it into a different problem. The problem that I have is that I don't see any development in the character's thinking at the end of the novel. It just seems like whatever we want to presume about what he is thinking is off of the page. And it's something that we bring to the discussion about the value of communism in the world. And that, I think, is fine if done deliberately. But in his remarks, it seems to be more a matter of race than of what's actually in the novel. And that, to me, I think, is what problematizes it. I mean, do we have to listen to him as the author? I also am not seeing that too much with the race, although I think part of the we seems to imply race, at least you know a little bit, uh, as he is in a boat with other refugees. But I mean, my question is, do we have to take him at his word from an interview that is outside of this book? No, I mean, it depends what kind of critical lens you bring to literature in general, but I would say that an interview that came outside of this novel is not relevant to how you feel about this novel. I think the novel, in my view, is a self-contained work. And if you appreciate the novel and enjoy it, irrespective of the interview, the interview shouldn't interfere with that. There are lots of other people who view things more holistically, and the life and opinions outside of the work influences their opinions of the work. So it really varies a lot depending on what kind of reader you are. It's a very curious claim because so many Vietnamese are anti-communist. Well, that's what I'm getting to in the next question, yeah. So in that interview I mentioned earlier with Asian American Writers Workshop, Nguyen said, I want this book to provoke people to rethink their assumptions about this history and also about the literature they've encountered before to make them uncomfortable in a good way, which I think is what every writer would probably say about their novel. But besides that, I think that when Nguyen says this, he knows that he can't be totally explicit about what his intentions are, but I at least am willing to make some inferences. My impression here is that because the majority of the Vietnamese American community especially the older generation, had a very negative experience with communism that they fled from, they often tend to be on the Republican right. And because this is Nguyen's first novel, and because he is so exposed to leftist politics, especially with his academic work, I see the narrator as a stand-in for him. And when the narrator is working through these ideas, this is Nguyen working through these ideas on the page for the benefit of his reader. So if we put these two points together, do you think that we can conclude that Nguyen intended, or at least would like to target the Vietnamese American reader as part of a project that might rehabilitate communism in their eyes? Um, before I answer that directly, I want to point out that Lana is also very similar to Nguyen in certain ways. Lana is attending UC Berkeley the way he did, and she might be closer in age to where Nguyen was. I don't know that for sure, uh, but we could probably figure out if we did the math. They both look good in the all die. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I mean, have you seen pictures of him? He's a good looking guy. 
But anyway, I don't know how far I want to go down this path. <laughs> Which path? <laughs> Thinking about him in a now die. No, no about Yed's yeah, question about this intention. Uh, because I think rethinking history is different from rehabilitating communism. Uh, I think this novel does a good job of not painting any one side as being without egregious faults. But as was also evident in the text, he has said in interviews that Vietnam is at least partially responsible for some of the horrors visited on its own people. I don't see it. I don't see it as uh, rehabilitating communism for Vietnamese Americans. Well, when he says that he is not writing for white people, who then do you think he has in mind? That's not the part that I disagree with. I think he is writing for, well, I think he's writing for everyone. I think the quote is he's not writing specifically for white audience. He's writing a book that would be for any audience, probably specifically the Vietnamese audience, but I don't think he's only writing for Vietnamese either. I think he's challenging the hegemony of the white reader. He's saying that he's not only writing for that. Well, also, I think one of the reasons why he included the whole film aspect was that he's rejecting that, as you put it, hegemony, that view of Vietnam and of the war. And he's giving us a different view of it. I think what you're saying is perhaps a very different kind of rhetorical gesture than what I see is probable or at least possible. Because if he is stepping outside of this dominant paradigm of all writers writing for a presumed white audience, then I would argue that he would be stepping out of one paradigm and into another. And he would be writing for X audience. And that, I think, is more likely, even if it's not what he intended, that's what's more likely to happen. But what I think you're saying is, is that he is stepping outside of the paradigm of writing for an implicitly white audience and simultaneously inventing a new way for an author to address an audience where he's writing for everybody. And that, to me, I think is an interesting thing, but I don't know if it's terribly realistic. I think that when he says that he is writing with the privilege of a majority writer, where he never has to translate or pander, that's because the majority writer presumes that he is writing to the majority. When a minority writer takes up a different position in relation to the majority, I think they have to pick an audience. That's what he's trying to do, is he's writing as if he's a majority writer. Yeah, but when majority writers write, they presume a majority audience. Right, and that's what he's doing. He's presuming a majority audience. That would mean he's writing to white people, because white people are the majority. No, no. I think that's maybe where we differ on the interpretation of what he said. I think what he's doing is he's writing as if his people are the majority audience, and you are the outsider. That's what I think he's doing. Right. So if he's doing that, then it comes back to what I said earlier, where he is writing to the Vietnamese community. I mean, it's a difference. It's different. Like, would you also make the claim that any white writer is writing for a white audience? I mean, I guess you could make that claim, but you'd say, like, it's not a claim that you would readily make, right? You would make that claim for a minority writer, like you said, but not for a white writer. I think he's taking on that privilege. Right. The implication with a white writer writing for a white audience isn't that others are excluded, even if they implicitly may be excluded. The implication is that they are writing for everyone, even if not everyone will share those viewpoints. The presumption, as false as it may be, is that they are writing for everyone, even if they are writing for a white audience. So I think he's doing the same thing or attempting the same thing, but from the other perspective. He's presuming a majority as if the Vietnamese community is the majority. And by extension, saying everyone can read this, everyone is my audience, even if he knows he might lose people along the way. I guess the issue here is that when white writers 
in a majority white context write novels, they write with kind of two minds. There is a, I don't know if you want to call it a deceit or a duality or whatever, but they imagine themselves writing for a white audience, but other people are invited along for the ride because they imagine their experience as a universal experience. And when they invite other people along for the ride, basically what they're saying is you can share in this inner life that I'm putting on the page if you want to be universal like us. If you want to not share in this experience, if this is going to be remaining something distinct from your life, that's your own kind of private ghetto of minority experience. And that, I think, is something that is unfair to do, but that's the, the situation as I understand it. So when Duin is writing, and he's not writing for a white audience, it could be said that he is presuming his experience to be universal, and that's what he's doing when he takes up this position as if he were writing for the majority, or he's taking the privilege of a majority writer. But I don't know if Nguyen would actually want to take on the second part of that position, which is presuming that he and his experiences are universals. That's the issue for me. I don't know how they could be universal other than the struggle that the character faces throughout the book of being stuck between two worlds. While I don't think all readers can claim to be stuck between two worlds, they can understand his predicament. It feels unsolvable to me because he never says, he never like clarifies exactly what he means. So we're just trying to interpret like a few sentences from something he said at a workshop. It's definitely a possibility because I do think that Nguyen is a person, not even as a writer, but as a person who understands the value of rhetoric. He understands the value of speaking and who you're speaking to. And I think because he has a particularly strong leftist orientation, he would feel at odds with this community that he, I think, has a lot of love for having a politics that are very different from his. So I see a motivation for him to write and think this way. Obviously, we can't know what his intentions are because we can't see into his soul. But I'm saying that there is a case to be made for it. Yeah, I think it's interesting. But for me, it's almost one step too far because he's so clear with the issues that he takes issue with, right? The representation of Vietnamese in film, for example. Like, it's so clear where he stands on so many issues that it seems to me this treatment of communism is not very clear. It's not similarly clear. So he leaves it up for interpretation, whereas he leaves so many other ideas not up for interpretation. I think the reason why is because this is an issue in his community where the jury is still out. Things are changing. The older generation is much more anti-communist than his generation, and probably the youngsters even less so. But there is still a lot of residual enmity, and it's much easier for him to go full bore against Hollywood, because that's obvious. It's much easier for him to go full bore against the orientalizing professor in the ethnic studies department. That's obvious. This thing is much more nuanced and much more complicated. That's what I think is really the reason why his rhetoric has to become much more subtle than it is in the other parts of the novel. So this whole series that we're talking about is rich countries and poor countries. In that context, how do a community's politics show the difference between the immigrant experience and the minority experience? Because I think there is a distinction to be found. Oh, I definitely think there's a distinction. And I think we do see that in the book. You can compare Sophia Mori and Lana. They both have complicated feelings about their U.S. home, but they're not the same feelings. They're not equal. 
Lana is rebelling against more traditional Vietnamese ways. And she seems to have completely embraced this new American life for herself. Sophia is older, but as we talked about in a previous episode, she's lived through World War II and the internment camps, but she asserts her citizenship and says you have to take it because white Americans will not give it, even though she was born in the U.S. I think there are similarities, but they are very different experiences. I think as a general rule, in the context of someone from a poor country moving to a rich country, the minority experience tends to be further to the left than the immigrant experience. So when you say minority, do you mean generally just someone born here? Yes, I would say that this is like the second generation minority and onwards. Right, right. So they might not have the same touchstones that the generation before them, or at least the immigrant generation would have. Yeah, the struggle remains, but it's a different kind of struggle. And I think that the struggles of immigrants are often resolvable in terms of a demand for law and order. I think that often a lot of people who come to countries that have very rigid legal systems and very defined rules and rule of law, they're often comforted by that. I think mentions this in part of the novel that you know, American life can be predictable. If you have a legal conflict, there are parameters that you can expect. That's a value to certain people. Minorities, second generation and onward, who take that as a given, they want more. And I think that their demands are valid, but different from the immigrant experience. I would almost reword this question in a different way, because I think when immigrants immigrate, they bring their own political paradigm and try to fit them in to the U.S. political paradigm, you know, that of left and right. And we do it all the time. Like, if we ever read news from Eastern Europe or from Africa or some other country that is substantially different politically from us, we just try to slot them in the way we conceive of politics. Like, this is the left-wing party, that's the right-wing party. And if you are ever on an international forum like Reddit, for example, you can see, like, the American commentators really struggle with this. Because when they view something, they have to view it from the point of view of left and right, because that's what we struggle with in our day-to-day -day lives. It's the same for immigrants. When they come into America, they have their own established political paradigms, and then they have to adjust to a new political paradigm. And I don't think they can, initially anyway. It's quite different for a second, third generation minority because they grew up here, so they know and are familiar with the political paradigm. And minorities in the U.S. at least tend to be more left because the right excludes them. So for me, it's kind of a different question. It's a question of how the politics of their home country aligns with the politics of America and how what they escape from aligns with what different parties represent. With that said, we'll take a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about the sequel. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. So there is a sequel to this novel, and it has the same characters. And of course, we haven't read it. 
but it has already been published. Uh, this novel is set in 1982, which I think is important because it places it in the world before the fall of the USSR. Do you think that the narrator's politics might change in that novel? I don't think so. Is that a problem? What I would expect is that the narrator would be confronted with different political problems. I don't think his politics necessarily need to change, but they are going to be challenged in different ways. Let me ask kind of a follow-up to this. I think that this is a novel or a pair of novels that are very much set in our world. I think it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. That being the case, if the follow-up novel was set in 2002 rather than 1982, and the narrator's politics still have not changed, how would you feel about that? Because of his strident communist belief? Because this is before communism falls? Is that why? It's inhabiting our world, so it needs to react to history. And if it happens in 2002, there's a whole set of events that I think the novel should react to. At the end of this novel, it's what, 1979. For him to have his personal worldview, I didn't see him work through these ideas to arrive at that worldview, but I can accept it as a historical moment. But if we have a sequel set in 2002, with all of those things that I mentioned happening in history, and it doesn't change, and it isn't modified in some way in response to history, I would feel very let down. I think this goes to what we prioritized from this novel, because I think you mentioned earlier, you read this as chiefly a political novel focused on communism and you know attitudes towards, whereas I just didn't. Like I, I definitely see it. I think it's a part of the book, especially the last third. But for me, it's much more of a book about identity and duality than it is about politics, because I think it's much more problematic, not in like a good way, but in like an ill-defined way. Right. Well, now that I've got the last word, we'll stop here. Thank you for listening. If you disagreed with us, you can let us know on Reddit or on social media at CanonicalPod. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can give us a nice review on Apple or your podcast platform of choice. Next week, we'll be back with a review of Paradise by Abdul Razak Gurna, Nobel Prize winner. Till then, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.